Hi, welcome back everyone to the last session of uh, our Quantum Week of Fun's Quantum Algorithms Workshop. Um, uh, I have the pleasure to introduce Alex Kersner from University of Waterloo and IQC, who's been to, and he's going to tell us about fast simulation of planar Clifford circuits. Um, Alex, go ahead. Great, thanks very much for the introduction and uh, thanks for having me and organizing the workshop. It's been really great so far. Uh, right, so this is joint work with David Gossett, Daniel Greer and Luke Schaefer and we're all at, uh, we're all at University of Waterloo and also at IQC. So broadly speaking, this talk is about, uh, is about classical simulation. So there are a few different reasons why you might care about this in the first place. So, for one, you might want to just understand where quantum advantages actually lie. So if you're going to spend lots of money and you know, lots, expend lots of energy building a quantum computer, you'd better make sure that you're going to use it for something that couldn't just be done classically. And maybe another reason is when you actually do build a quantum computer, you want to check correctness. So you want to make sure that it's actually doing what you wanted it to do. So broadly speaking, like a typical simulation task would be you have some quantum circuit with a bunch of, with maybe you have M gates, and you'd like to sample from the output distribution. So it's like simulating a measurement. And of course you can always do this just in this naive way where it's like a matrix vector multiplication and you do a lot of multiplication, uh, but we're interested in cases where this brute force approach uh, where we can do better. So uh, the first improvement that I want to introduce is this result of Markov and Xi who they say, if you take your circuit and you map it to a graph by replacing every gate and every input qubit with a vertex, and then every portion of a wire gets mapped to an edge between those two vertices, then they give a simulation algorithm that uh, depends on the tree width of the underlying graph. So you might not know what tree width is, that's fine. The point is that it's some kind of geometric they're using some kind of geometry of the underlying of the circuit. Okay, so that's this is a very general uh, simulation algorithm. They don't make any assumptions about what the uh, like what the gates are, and we'd like to combine this idea with known techniques for Clifford simulation. So, if you haven't seen uh, a Clifford circuit, it's essentially you're allowed to input the all zero state, and then you're allowed only to apply gates from this limited gate set. So Hadamard. S and controlled Z. And Gottesman Canil and then uh, Aronson Gottesman later showed that Clifford circuits can be simulated efficiently. So I'm not going to explain like, all the details of how this goes, but I'll just say that uh, essentially they show that there's an efficient way to represent the quantum state at any portion of the circuit. And every time you apply a gate or you measure qubits, you can update that representation uh, in, these efficient, in this efficient way. So uh, in particular, doing the update for an application of a gate costs linear time, and measuring k qubits, you can do this in kn squared time. Uh, and for the purposes of this talk, it's really the measurement that's the bottleneck, because even measuring one qubit, um, you're already surpassing uh, the cost of applying a gate. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about this other result in our paper, which shows that working completely within the Aronson, well, more or less completely within the Aronson Gottesman framework, uh, you can boil this measurement procedure down to matrix multiplication. So uh, let's just, to parse this more easily, let's assume we want to measure all of the qubits, so k is n. Then before we would have this runtime of n cubed, and we show that you can actually boil this down to n to the omega, where omega is the matrix multiplication constant. So it's, it's two or maybe two point something. Okay, so back to the main, uh, the main thread here. So the question is, can we combine this idea of Markov and Xi of using uh, geometric uh, properties of the circuit with techniques specifically for Clifford simulation? So the result that we show is that if you have this Clifford circuit, we're gonna, we're gonna map the Clifford circuit to a graph, but it's gonna be a little different than Markov and Xi. So what we do is we map every qubit to a vertex and we put an edge between two vertices if and only if there's a, a controlled Z gate that acts on those two qubits. So for example, AB is an edge here, and that's because there's a controlled Z gate acting on qubits A and B. So the result that we show is that if this graph that you produce is planar, 
then we can sample from the output distribution of this circuit in time and to the omega over two, and then you also pay this cost that depends on the depth. But in, the, in particular, when you're looking at a constant depth circuit, uh, before, if you were to simulate this with just regular Clifford simulation techniques, you would get this cost of, well, previously it was n cubed, and now we just said it was n to the omega. Um, so this is a quadratic improvement on uh, previous results. So the way that we do this is we, uh, we reduce it to a problem that involves graph states. So if you haven't seen a graph state before, essentially, if you have a, just a graph, you can form this associated graph state where you replace every vertex with a qubit and you bring those qubits into the all plus state. So that's why we have this layer of Hadamards. Um, and then whenever you have an edge in the graph, you put a controlled Z gate uh, between those qubits. So for example, AC is an edge over here and oh, we have a controlled Z gate A and C. And uh, it, maybe I'll, it's worth noting here that these controlled Z gates, they all commute, they're, you know, they're diagonal, they all commute, and it doesn't matter what the control is and what the target is. So we say that the state produced, once you do all this, is the graph state. So we'll write like catchy. And so the task that we spend really the bulk of our time considering is what we call a graph state simulation problem. So you're given a graph, and then for every vertex, you're given some local poly operator, so x, y, or z. And the, the goal is to output some potential measurement outcome when you measure that graph in those bases. So in this picture, these u of whatever, these are like change of basis operators. And then we just measure in the standard basis. And uh, so this task has kind of been considered before. So in, this, in the special case where you're looking at the grid graph, it's known that quantum circuits can do this in constant time um, because the graph has constant degree, so you can apply these gates. Uh, you can apply these gates in with constant depth. Excuse me. Um, and it's been shown that uh, classical circuits cannot do this in constant depth. So the grid graph is well known, but uh, the case of general graphs hasn't really been studied before. And so the result that we show is that uh, a classical computer can solve the graph state simulation problem in time. So by time, really, I mean gate complexity. So we're not talking about depth, we're talking about number of gates. Uh, and so it's in time or gate complexity n to the omega over two when the graph is planar. And so similarly to the previous slide, if you wanted to do this with just standard Clifford simulation, you would incur this cost of n to the omega. And so what we have is a, a quadratic improvement on that. Okay, so uh, on the next slide, I'm gonna come back to the Clifford circuit simulation thing, and then uh, I'm gonna explain how we solved the graph state simulation problem. So the task, if you remember, is we have some Clifford circuit C, and we'd like to sample from the output distribution. So the way that the reduction goes is we start by padding this circuit with Hadamards on either side. So you can see we haven't really done anything here. Of course, it's, you know, the circuit is gonna produce all the same outputs. But it has the benefit of first we map this all z the first layer of Hadamard's maps the all zero state to the all plus state, which is we're going to need if we want to produce a graph state. And the last layer of Hadamard's, well, remember if you want to measure in the x basis, you apply a Hadamard and then measure in the standard basis. And similarly, if you want to measure in the y basis, you apply an s gate and then a Hadamard and then measure. So you can see we're kind of setting up for some graph state stuff here. And then with all the remaining Hadamards, everything on the interior, we gadgetize it with this Hadamard gadget. So this Hadamard gadget, we add a qubit and we implement the Hadamard gate up, up to this poly air. So you might think, okay, this is like a horrible deal because we've added a qubit and we're not even implementing the gate that we want. And we have two Hadamards in here, like, like what are we doing? Um, but it turns out that using this gadget has this nice benefit of it pushes all the Hadamards to the exterior of the circuit. And so we get the circuit with a very nice structure where all that's left on the inside are controlled Zs and Ss. And since these are all, these all commute, we can, we can actually split them up. So these dotted lines mean there might be some control Zs, we don't really know where they are, but they're there. So Notice now that the state produced right in the middle of this circuit is a graph state. It 
it's a bunch of control Zs acting on the all plus state. And the second half of the circuit is just a bunch of basis changes. So you're either changing to the Y basis or the X basis, depending on uh, whether or not there's an S here. And so if we measure right at the end of this circuit, this is exactly a, we're solving the graph state simulation task. Uh, there is one little catch here. So some of the qubits, uh, the gadgetized qubits, are going to tell us which Pauli error we've made. And the state on the remaining qubits is actually only going to be the output of the circuit up to this Pauli error. And I'm not going to talk about how we correct the Pauli error, but maybe I'll just say that if you know that you've made some Pauli error at some stage in the circuit, um, there are some very simple ways to see how that's going to propagate through to the end, and then you can correct it. Now, so we've established that this is an instance of the graph state simulation problem, but what is the graph produced right in the middle here? Um, so it turns out that this graph produced in the middle here is very similar to the graph uh, that's underlying the original circuit C. And if the original circuit C was planar, this new graph is going to be not quite planar, but close enough that our techniques will still carry through. And so we can get the solution in time uh, n to the omega over 2, and then uh, we pay this depth cost um, to kind of account for the not quite planarity. So that's the idea of the reduction. And now I'm just going to talk about the graph state simulation task. OK, so this whole enterprise really started. We were trying to understand an improved algorithm for the case of the grid graph. So here we have like a root n by root n grid. And the naive approach would be to classically prepare all n qubits. So we're kind of initializing our representation of the state. And then we can update that representation when we apply all the gates in like whatever order we want. And then finally, we can simulate measurements on all of the qubits. And I said at the beginning of the talk that the measurement is really what dominates here. So just using like the naive approach, we get this cost of n to the omega. And so we were trying to understand this better algorithm that relies on recursion. So it's kind of like a divide and conquer approach. So what we do instead is we split up the graph into quadrants and we work on each quadrant separately and then combine the results at the end. So what do I mean by this? So first what we do is we prepare these kind of sub grid graph states. Uh, we do this recursively. And then everything on the interior, so every qubit on the interior, well, we've already applied all of the edges that are incident to it. And so we can measure this qubit, and then we don't have to carry it around in our representation of the state anymore. So black in this diagram means we've measured it, it's gone, we don't have to deal with it anymore. And after we do this recursion, there's only uh, a constant times square root n uh, of these red qubits that remain to be measured that we're carrying around. And so since we only have root n of them carrying around, to carry around, we can just use regular Clifford simulation techniques and uh, simulate applying the gates. And then we can finish the recursion by simulating measurements on the interior. Um, and so we do this recursion, recursion, recursion. And then at the very end, okay, we measure everything on the perimeter of the grid. And uh, so if you just solve this recurrence relation, you see that the cost of, uh, of measuring the qubits on the perimeter, this is what dominates. So we get this runtime that's uh, n to the omega over 2 as compared to just n to the omega. And OK, so what makes this, this technique really tick is that we're dividing up the grid and we're handling only a few qubits at a time. And we're using the fact that once you apply all of the, the gates or the edges incident to a vertex, you can measure it and then you don't have to carry it around anymore. So that's the trick. You know, handle as few qubits as you need to. OK, so how do we generalize this? Well, the tool that we use, and this tool has been used before, um, the Markov and Xi paper that I mentioned earlier used this idea of a treaty composition. So uh, over here, I have a graph. And then on the right, I have a treaty composition for that graph. So a treaty composition consists of a set of bags, which are subsets of the vertex set, which are arranged in a tree. So OK, this is a tree here. And there are three rules you have to follow. So every vertex has to appear in a bag. So let's pick vertex C. And oh, there's a C over here. 
the second rule is that any the endpoints of every edge have to appear somewhere. So B, C is an edge, and oh, B and C appear over here. And then the last rule is maybe the trickiest. Um, it's that any given vert the bags containing any given vertex have to form a connected subtree. So let's pick vertex D, and we look at the bags containing D, and it's these three. And this is a connected subtree, so we're good. Okay, so I, I mentioned tree width at the very beginning in terms of the Markov and sheet paper. So uh, I'll just say that the width of a tree decomposition is the size of the biggest bag minus one. And we say that the tree width of a graph is just the minimum width over all tree decompositions. Uh, this minus one here is just for technical reasons. I, I'm not going to explain it. So part of what makes our algorithm work nicely for planar graphs is that the tree width for planar graphs uh, has this nice upper bound, which is uh, O of root n. Um, and also, one, also another nice thing is that you can compute a tree decomposition uh, quite effectively. OK, so how do we convert a tree decomposition into a simulation algorithm? So really, at the heart of our algorithm is this mapping from a tree decomposition to a circuit. And the circuit mirror, the structure of the circuit mirrors the structure of our tree decomposition. So here I have an example of a graph. And I have an example of a tree decomposition for the graph. And I've rooted the tree decomposition. And the special thing about this tree decomposition is that there are basically only three types of bags. So the first type are these green bags in which a vertex appears for the first time. It doesn't appear anywhere farther down the tree. So you can see vertex D is in here, but there's no vertex D in here. And by the connectivity property, we know that it can't appear anywhere else because then we wouldn't have a connected subtree. The second type of bag uh, are the pink bags. And this is kind of the opposite. A qubit is being like forgotten. So vertex C appears in this bag, but it does not appear uh, in the pink bag. And again, by the connectivity property, we know that that means it can appear anywhere else in the tree. The last type of bag is probably the trickiest. So we have this kind of merge operation going on. So uh, this is where the blue, the blue bag kind of contains, uh, contains the union of its children. And uh, in this mapping, basically, we have a mapping that says, for every type of bag, here's what, you, here's what you do in your circuit. So for the green bags in which a qubit appears for the first time, it's like an introduced, we initialize a qubit corresponding to that vertex uh, in the plus state. So we're getting ready to form a graph state. Uh, for the pink bags, this is where a qubit is being forgotten. It's, it's not going to appear anywhere higher up the tree. So if it's being forgotten, well, we better apply all of the, the gates corresponding to that vertex's edges. And then, well, once we've applied all the gates, we might as well measure it, because we know it's not going to appear higher up the tree. The third type of gate is, again, it's the trick. The third type of gadget is the, the trickiest. So notice that we have a qubit uh, corresponding to vertex B over here. And we have another qubit corresponding to vertex B over here. And so what we do is we use this little gadget that merges these qubits into one. So we apply C naught gate, and then we project onto the, the zero state, and that implements this merge operation. Um, I'll get back to the, how we actually do this post selection in a minute. But for now, let me just say that uh, you can work your way up the tree. And uh, for, all, for each of the three types of bags, um, we have these rules that tell you what you have to do in your circuit. And I mean, it's not immediately obvious, but you can show that uh, the state, ignoring these post-selected qubits, the state immediately before measurement on the remaining qubits is actually the graph state. OK, so uh, what's the time complexity or the gate complexity of simulating, uh, simulating this circuit? So for each, uh, notice that for each, for the portion of the, of the circuit corresponding to a bag, you, can, you only need to handle a number of qubits that's equal more or less to the size of the bag. So basically, we can simulate this bag without having to carry around the qubits over here. 
And so what we get is if we assume that we, so for an upper bound for the, uh, the time complexity, is we can assume we're measuring everything in every bag. So this is an overestimate, but it, it's kind of the best we can do. So what we get is we're summing over all of the bags, and it's the size of the bag to the omega. And it turns out when you have a planar graph, you can form uh, a particularly nice tree decomposition such that this, this expression uh, is upper bounded by n to the omega over 2. And the idea is to get this tree decomposition by using uh, these planar separators. This is an old idea of Lipton, Rose, and Tarjan. Now, uh, in the general, in the non planar case, you can't do this. Um, and so our algorithm still works, and we can upper bound the runtime of simulating the circuit like this. But the catch is that there isn't really an efficient way to compute a tree decomposition when you don't have a planar graph. Um, and so our algorithm kind of assumes you're given a tree decomposition to begin with, which uh, may or may not be difficult to get. Okay, so the last loose end to tie up is this business with post selection. So the way that we handle the post selection is first we just forget about it. We simulate the entire uh, the entire circuit, and then we try to correct it. So let's suppose we've simulated the entire circuit. And we have some bit string of measurement results such that the state produced by the such that it's in the support of the state produced by the circuit. So I'm representing the circuit with U here. And what we'd like is we'd like for some bits of Y uh, to be equal to zero, because we need certain measurement results to have been attained. So uh, I'm going to claim that if you can find some Pauli that stabilizes the state produced by the circuit. So the state produced by the circuit is an eigenstate with eigenvalue one. And this Pauli maps the, the result that you got to any result that you'd be happy with. Then that result that you'd be happy with actually is a potential measurement result. And in that case, you're done. So Z would be your solution to the graph state simulation problem. And uh, I mean, it's not immediate how you do this, but I'll say that we can show that such a Pauli always exists. And in fact, you can find it in linear time. So that's the idea of how we solve the graph state simulation problem. So uh, I'll just wrap up and say that our, uh, what we spend the bulk of our time working on is showing that you can solve the graph state simulation problem in time n to the omega over 2 for a planar graph. And this is a quadratic improvement upon um, on previous like Clifford simulation uh, methods. And the way that we do this is first we find a treaty composition, we map it to a circuit, we simulate that circuit, um, and then we find uh, a poly that'll correct and handle this, uh, this post selection business. And the application that we showed is that uh, if the controlled Z gates of a Clifford circuit act only on edges of a planar graph, then you can sample from that, that Clifford circuit in time n to the omega over 2, and then you pay this cost depending on the depth. And again, this is a quadratic improvement um, for constant depth circuits. OK, so uh, one thing that I didn't talk about is we also solved this uh, graph state simulation problem with post selection, in which you like to measure a graph state, but you also want to post select on particular outcomes. So all of our algorithms carry through. Um, to that setting. And in terms of open problems following our work, so uh, the two that I'm most interested in is first, well, for non planar and bounded degree graphs, we know that quantum circuits can, uh, can solve the graph state simulation problem with a linear number of gates. And if our algorithm is optimal, um, if our classical algorithm is optimal, then there might be a separation. Uh, between quantum and classical for this uh, this problem. And uh, the second open problem is uh, whether we can combine our simulation methods for Clifford circuits with uh, stabilizer rank methods. So the idea with a stabilizer rank method is if you have a Clifford circuit with a handful of non-Clifford gates, you can decompose the non-Clifford gates into linear combinations of Cliffords, uh, and then simulate each term separately and combine the results at the end. And so it remains to be seen whether we can combine uh, our Clifford simulation method with, uh, with stabilizer rank. 
And uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Alex, for this uh, very clear and uh, uh, talk on, the, on a bunch of interesting problems. So you have a big round of applause for me and everybody else listening in the audience. Um, I'm going to go to Slack and see if there are any, any questions. Um, so there aren't any questions now, some, uh, some applauses. So uh, while we wait, um, I, I know you mentioned a little bit um, um, about open problems re re regarding optimality. Yeah. I was wondering if you have anything more to say about this um, for if, if your results for um, planar graphs um, come with any sort of optimality or at least some intuition on, around this? Yeah, we're not sure whether the planar graph case um is optimal, uh, we don't know. All right, I see uh, there are um, um, some people typing. So, um, So I guess while we wait, why don't I ask you another question? Um, so um, um, there is some sort of um, general research directions on, on um, um, I guess, mostly related to IQP and restricted uh, classes of computation, where um, they're also interested in this in, in the sampling problem. Um, and the structure of the circuit is, is some, some very similar to, to what you have in this case, only in the middle of this, it, it's kind of restricted to a specific specific type, type of, um, uh, for example, of, you know, for the specific type of, of, of circuits, um, um, for instance, um, rever class, uh, reversible circuits. So I was wondering if um, you can comment if any of the techniques that you have here could, um, apply could be generalized in those kind of cases? Uh, to, sorry, to what type of cases? So for example, when, so you had, so in the circuit structures that you had, you had the MAR gates followed by control Z in sort of various places depending on the graph structure, if I, if I and that's what my understanding, so, and followed by Hadamard gate. So what if kind of you replace in the bit in the middle with some, some other, um, so I'm, I'm asking if, if, if there's anything in your techniques that could go uh, beyond, you know, beyond um, control Z using other, other types of, of circuits in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure. I mean, I think the control Z gates are pretty crucial because we need to, uh, we need to produce a graph state. Mm -hmm. And um, if you don't, if you don't have a graph state, I mean the whole the whole algorithm kind of falls apart because we're working on graph states. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Okay, so we have thanks. So we have some questions in this Slack channel from Alex Eddington. Is finding the planar separators of the graph cheap compared to the runtime of the algorithm? Yes. Yeah, you can find a planar separator in I think linear time. So it's, yeah, it's very efficient. And Ross Duncan is asking, uh, um, so he's saying, sorry to ask a question, which is basically, I missed uh, beginning, but why planar graphs? Um, yeah, so that's a good question. So basically the, the crux of it is that planar graphs admit these, uh, I had this extra slide and I didn't want to use it, but planar graphs admit these really nice treaty compositions um, that you get from using planar separators. And uh, it turns out that if you produce a treaty composition by using a planar separator, um, you get uh, this nice upper bound on the sum of the bags to the omega. Um, there, I think this separator trick also works for like graphs of bounded genus, um, but basically it boils down to, we're able to produce a really nice treaty composition. Okay. 
Um, I guess that's uh, all in terms of questions. So thanks a lot, Alex. Um, uh, you get a final round of applause for me. Uh, okay, thanks. Thank you.